recording. Uh, hi, everybody, and uh, welcome to BSA Online. So it's um, 8 p.m. GMT, and uh, it's one before last uh, talk or event on BSA Online this season. Uh, so before giving the floor to Dennis, I want to make two very short announcements. Uh, first, about uh, the very last session of this season, uh, which will happen in two weeks, but not on Monday, rather on Thursday. Thursday, the 15th of June, will be the last session of this uh, webinar. Uh, the same time, uh, 8 p.m. GMT, I will send uh, a reminder to you, and it will be... Uh, a hybrid event so we will uh, meet physically here in Lulio and uh, you will connect uh, you will have a possibility to connect online to join the um, um, panel discussion about uh, challenges and future development directions in BSA and hyperdimensional computing. So this was the first announcement. And the last announcement is about um, new talks, new season. So uh, I am started to, uh, to form a program for the next season of the webinar. So if you're volunteering to give a talk, so please drop me a line and uh, I will uh, schedule your talk gladly uh, on one of the available slots. So that's it from my side, and I leave the floor to you, Dennis, please. Yeah, thanks, Dennis. So let us start with sharing the screen. So I hope you guys could see the slides. And yes. Everything is visible, yeah. So let's get the laser pointer, and yeah, let's start. So the idea, the idea of this talk was uh, essentially to cover uh, the paper that that is about to be published uh, at Neural Computation. And in this paper, we talk about a different 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 ways of retrieving or decoding information from what as we call them holistic representations, but from hypervectors essentially. And one practical thing that if you want to take a look at the paper, there is uh, it's it's up on archive right now because because we've realized that uh, neural computation was a little bit challenging to obtain the paper from, and then also even so I was leading the project. It was a a number of people from uh, the Redwood Center at UC Berkeley involved in the project. So it was uh, Connor Pinchon, Fritz, Bruna, Paxson, Fritz, and I. And I think with that, we're ready to start. And uh, as an introduction, I would like to go a bit of an unconventional way and just talk a little bit at the high level about the papers that, that have inspired this project. And so one of this paper was uh, our 2018 paper that we internally very often refer to as capacity theory. Uh, and the idea of this paper was that uh, was to better understand theoretically how 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 one could be able to analytically predict the amount of information, or in this case, even like a, a simpler step, sort of the, the accuracy when decoding data structure from distributed representations. And here you just see an example of, from this paper, and we will talk in details about particular techniques that were considered in this paper. But, but uh, the project that I'm presenting is extending the number of these techniques. And if you would be interested to get an overview of it, I've, I've pasted a link to Fritz's talk that he gave at a NICE workshop in 2018. Then another, the second paper that inspired this work uh, is hyperdimensional modulation paper by by Hun Seo Kim, and there is also a link to the recording. So uh, he gave a BSA webinar a while ago on this work, and the main inspiration from this paper come from the of the so-called idea of successive inference cancellation. That, uh, and and uh, we will talk again in details about the success of interference cancellation because it's one of the primitives the way we see how one, that, that that could be used when when decoding information from hyper vectors 
And the third paper that was also inspirational for this project it's, uh, is uh, Michael Hersch's uh, and others paper uh, from a couple of years ago at, uh, brain, in brain informatics. And this paper was also, you know, um, it was also presented at VSA online. So it's, that's why it's great to have it as an ongoing activity. So you know, like references could be given at the level of uh, video recordings. And so the inspiration uh, for this paper is as essentially an experimental protocol that is that we're also going to use and slightly extend. But essentially the experiment, the experimental protocol that could be used in order, in order to compare various decoding techniques, in order to see what is happening, for example, with, with the accuracy of decoding as, as we change some of the parameters uh, of, of the problem, or like what, what happens with the information read. And we will have a slide about this uh, performance metrics. So no worries if you don't fully get it. So that, that, that these three slides were just mainly to recapitulate uh, the motivation and sort of the the key roots like how sort of we came up with the idea with with the idea for this project and so given given that motivation we we can start with more formal and dry part and introduce the problem like what what are we exactly going to do and uh, since since we're going to study decoding information from distributed representation. The first question, right, is, is like, how do we encode information into distributed representation? And of course, we, we all know, I think, that, that there are like various data structures that, that could be encoded into distributed, distributed representations, and they could be very elaborated. But for the sake of this task, uh, it's sufficient to go with sequences. Uh, and when talking about sequences, there is a so-called trajectory association problem that uh, Tony Plate has introduced in, in his holographic recurrent networks paper that, that has been uh, presented quite quite some time ago. And, and uh, the, like what we see here following thing is like a slight modification of that problem. And so formally what we have as our initial setup is that we, we have an alphabet of D unique symbols, and we represent each symbol as a ram, random hypervector. And for the sake of simplicity, we just go with multiply at permute model. And so we use bipolar vectors. And so now, since we have now D and dimensional hypervectors, this, this creates our code book that, that we, we, we will denote as phi through, through the presentation. And so it's it's n by d matrix effectively. But this, this is our starting point. Then of course we need to represent our sequence. So it's just you know here is an example of some sequence. It's not random, but we in in simulations of course we use random sequences. So and uh, we denote the length of sequences we and. In order to encode a particular position within a sequence, we're going to use the idea of random permutation that was very well highlighted in uh, Pente's paper, the, the, the 2009 paper. And uh, in, in our recent survey, we also highlighted like various other papers like that, that have done very similar ideas in terms of how one can um, do sequence encoding. But with, within that, that paper, we go with, with uh, permutation-based encoding. And so effectively, what we're going to use, we take one particular random permutation. And for, for position i, in, in order to represent symbol in that position, we're going to apply this permutation d minus 1 times. And this is denoted as here. So, right? so we pick in a position i in sequence s, we pick the corresponding hypervector from the code book. We apply our random permutation b minus one times. And so now the sum sign, this denotes the superposition. So now we combine all the encode, encoded, uh, position encoded hypervectors together. And this is our, our hypervector y, that is compositional representation of the whole structure. 
So this is our encoding. And of course, so what we want to do, uh, oh, sorry, yeah. There is also an example, how we like a concrete example. So let's let's say we have A, B, C, D, E, like this is our uh, sequence with five symbols. And so we just start, you know, going backwards. So it's like a recency effect. And so we, the most recent symbol in the sequence is not permitted at all. The, the second most recent is permitted once, and then twice, three times, four times, and so on. This, this is our encoding. And then of course, yeah, we, we have the decoding task. And the decoding task is that given, given that we know why, phi, and of course, implicitly, we know how the encoding has been done. We want to reconstruct the sequence S, and this is the we denote as S hat. So that, that is our problem formulation. And if there are any questions at, at any point, I think it would be good just just you know to stop immediately and discuss you know, and clarify if there, is, if there is anything that is unclear. So far, so good. So we then an important thing that was going to be leveraged as, as a part of, um, of comparing various decoding techniques and, all, and also categorizing them is the idea that we can actually take this encoding that we just saw and we can, we can connect it to the ideas of uh, sparse coding and compressed sensing. And so how we, do we do it? So simply by just slightly reinterpreting the encoding. So now we can think instead of permitting a particular hyper vector that, that we picked from the code, we, we actually create the permuted versions of phi. So we, we permuted, like we start from unpermuted version, then we permuted once, twice, and so and so on until all the way till till like we apply permutation d minus one times. And so now we can concatenate all these permitted code books. And so we kind of get a giant code book uh, that, that we denote as A. So it now contains all the permuted code books file. And now A is our new dictionary or new code book. And then next modification that we have to do, next reinterpretation is that we create a vector X that has the dimensionality B, D which is a concatenation of one hot encoding of, of symbols that we have in S. So it's now like we have the first symbol and it's a D-dimensional one hot encoding. The second symbol and another D-dimensional. And so we stack, we, we stack, we concatenate together D such D-dimensional one hot vectors. And this, this is why X, you know, this is why X is, has the dimensionality B D. And so now given given these two ideas, the new the new giant uh, dictionary A and this one concatenation of one hot encodings in X, now we can reinterpret our encoding of S as A multiplied by X. So our whole encoding now is, is vector matrix multiplication, and that is exactly equivalent to what we've done before. And that's just, that is so because now instead of permuting a particular hypervector picked from the code book, we actually have all possible uh, permutations of the hypervectors between zero and B minus one. And then we have identity, like X is an identity vector that says which, which of the permuted hypervectors needs to be included within our representation Y. And so why is that important? Well, because now we can say that if we want to decode X, because that's what that is what we want to do, right? We want to reconstruct X. And now we can think of it as, as if it would be an optimization problem. So we, we know Y and we know A. And so now we want to find such an X that, that will minimize the, the error between A, X, and Y. And in addition to that, right, in addition to this formulation, we have a prior knowledge about X. And well, there is actually a particular knowledge about X that, that it has a particular structure, but the simple, but, but the other way, a more relaxed way to think about it is that X is sparse. And we will again discuss it slightly more in details, but 
idea that since we can think of X as being a sparse vector, we can solve the so-called Lasse problem. And, and which is characterized by adding the regularization, the regularization of um, that comes from L1 norm of X. And this is this part is important because it partially determined how we created our categorization. And we are very close to start talking about the categorization, categorization of the decoding techniques. But before we do that, we just discuss like we have one more background slide that is about performance metrics that we used in this study. And the very first intuitive performance metric, since we talk about uh, decoding of discrete data structures is, is accuracy, right? Like how accurate we are at reconstructing a particular sequence. Uh, and, and that is very simple to compute. So we have, we have our sequence S, the ground truth, we know it, of course, and then we have our re reconstruction S hat. And so we can compute each and every symbol within S. So that, that is what the first sum is doing. So we we create we, we compute the accuracy within a particular sequence, but because it could be like somewhat noisy because we work with random hypervectors and, and so on. So we, we would like to average this over G such random sequences. And so th this is the second the second sum sign. So, so A, then A in our case is just empirically measured accuracy of how accurate we are, how accurate we are at decoding like a particular, uh, a, a particular symbol within a sequence. And since our encoding doesn't have recency effect, like it doesn't matter which position of the sequence we're talking about. They all have equal, equal weight and representation. So therefore, there is no need to worry about a particular position number. So we just average, we, we can just average out across positions within the sequence. But then, uh, of course, accuracy is great. It's fairly intuitive. So we know that yeah, um, one accuracy one is perfect. But then uh, it's not so great when it comes to comparing, let's say, cases when we have different dictionaries, because then in the case of uh, different dictionaries, we, for example, would have different amount of information per symbol because it's locked to D. This is how much bits one, one symbol is carrying. So if we have four, four symbols in the alphabet, one symbol carries two bits of information, but if it's 32, then this, a single symbol will carry five bits of information. So therefore, it's also convenient to consider the, the amount of information per component as, a, as an asymmetric. And this equation below, it shows how we compute it. And it's idea that we can use the mutual information that that, that will in turn will require the accuracy. So essentially, like uh, amount of information per component is just you know, computed based on the accuracy. So it's just you know, getting this value is just following up from the accuracy. And so it takes into account, we can see that it takes into account the accuracy. It takes into account the size uh, of the alphabet. It also takes into account the number of symbols in the sequence, which is also convenient, right? Because now we, we, we can compare the situations when we encode sequences of different lengths. And we can also uh, average out the dimensionality of our distributed representation. So then we know bits per, per component of our distributed representation. And then this would allow us considering the representation that has more components compared to the one that has less components. And so that was, that was our background part. So we're done with it. So the, our next step is, is now the overview. So we are now ready to look and, and see what, what kind of decoding methods um, have we identified and, and how we've categorized them. And there is a couple of like, like levels of categorization and the largest level uh, that, that we came up with was 
the so-called selective decoding versus complete decoding. And so when I'm saying selective decoding, it means that you can decode a particular position within your data structure. So you can decode a position in your data structure without really worrying about decoding any other positions. So you can apply this, this such decoding techniques on per, per position within sequence structure. That uh, that that is that is a selective decoding, and there there are two options that you can do. So you, you can you can you can avoid relying on like covariance structure that might exist in in your code book, and if you don't do it, then we just simply call this decoding code book decoding. So it will literally re rely on your own file. But then additionally. You might rely on this on the covariance structure, and and we will talk in details about like what what this structure look like, how to compute this covariance structure, and then in this case we'll denote this uh, decode denote this technique as linear regression based technique, and then in contrast to selective techniques we have uh, complete uh, techniques and. I guess, as the name suggests, the idea of complete techniques is that we're actually going to decode the whole data structure. So we, we're going to recreate the whole sequence. So even if we only need one particular position within a sequence, we would still have to reconstruct the whole thing. And it might not sound great that you have to do it, but it's actually quite often that you, you're not really interested in one particular thing you want to reconstruct the whole data structure. And the advantage of these complete techniques is that we might get improved, uh, improved accuracy and information per components because of uh, because we're trying to lev leverage on the whole information available about the data structure. And so, and then the, the division within complete techniques comes from this lasso problem that we just introduced a couple of slides ago. And so if the answer to like to explicitly solve the lasso problem is yes, then we're talking about the, the techniques from sparse coding slash compressed sense in literature and two particular algorithms that we are considering that, that we're using within the study are the so-called FISTA algorithm that stands for fast iterative shrinkage uh, trash coding algorithm and the CD algorithm that is coordinate descent. But there are many more of them. So it's, we, we just have chosen to use two, but but that, that's why this list, this, this list continues. And then if we don't use, and if we are not trying to solve the lesser problem explicitly, then we have other way, other set of techniques that are using the so-called feedback. We call them feedback-based. And within this feedback-based, we have uh, the selective by decoding as the starting point for these techniques that is enhanced, for example, with the explaining a way uh, that is the term uh, that, that we use to refer to the fact that we can try to leverage on the understanding of the encoding of the structure so we can try to remove the crosstalk noise that is present in our distributed representation uh, that comes from other other as a symbols that uh, that are jointly represented in uh, in our distributed representation or another technique that even builds on top of the explain in a way uh, we will call it we call it much in pursuit and we'll talk in details about this technique and the final thing that I want to mention on this slide is that we, in fact, could combine the ideas from feedback-based techniques and technique and optimization problem problems that are solved in Lasso, and come up with a so-called hybrid decoding techniques. That that, as a spoiler, I can say that this uh, in certain situations this will be the most performant techniques that that uh, we we were able to come up with. And uh, with that, I think we can 
get into details of different decoding techniques so that we just get better understanding of, of what these different techniques are doing. Uh, and then we have the, the final block about the exper experimental results. And so we start with the selective decoding techniques sort of highlighted here. And so this, this will be our navigation map. So the, the dashed rectangle will, will go, we, is going to show like where we are on, the, on this overview of the decoding techniques. And we start with the selective decoding because this is the most basic decoding one can think about. And so the task is that we want to decode a particular position I from our distributed representation. And for that, we introduce the so-called idea of the readout matrix. So it's a special matrix that, that is specific to this posi uh, position I. Uh, and we will discuss two ways how to compute this matrix. But let's say we know this matrix W out. And then in the, in the case when it's known, the only thing we need to do is compute the inner product with entries of this readout matrix and our distributed representation Y, and then we take the R arc max. And this is going to be the, the index we've seen within the code book for, for, the, for, the, for the very likeliest symbol in our current distributed representation Y. But so now we have a question, how do we compute the readout matrix? And the simplest way to do it is what we call code book decoding. So it's literally based on, on the knowledge, on the fact that we know our code book file. This is, uh, as, uh, as you recall, this is our initial assumption. And then also we know the structure of the encoding. So we know that we can, you know, in order to revert the encoding, we can apply inverse permutation. And so in this case, uh, we can use the we can apply reverse permutation to the code to the code book phi, uh, and this this will be our uh, code book uh, this will be our readout matrix for the position i for the code book decoded method, and of course alternatively we don't really have to manipulate the code book like in practice instead of like permuting the code book. We will just apply inverse permutation um, to our distributed representation Y, because so, so, it's just well, computation it would be way easier to apply inverse permutation to a vector rather than we would do it to a matrix. But this is just a practical consideration. So, because I, I think many people have done that in their own code uh, when playing with these ideas. So, but but formally we can think about applying inverse permutation. Uh, about applying permutation to the code book. That, that would be the way to get to get the matrix for the code book decoding. And then we have this alternative way that we call linear regression because uh, because in the most general case, and, and that, that idea comes from the literature on the reservoir computing, in the most uh, general case, you would compute the redout matrix uh, in assuming that you have some, some sort of supervised data. And so in that case, given that you have supervised data, you, would, you could, could have solved the problem uh, using something like a rich regression. But in this case, when we, when we have this synthetic problem of sequence encoding, we can actually compute uh, the readout matrix using the, the so-called the, uh, the inverse of the covariance matrix. So recall that this is exactly the code book matrix, but then additionally, we, we, we multiply the code book decoding matrix for the corresponding position I with the, the inverse of the covariance matrix. And this is how you can, can compute the covariance matrix. We're not gonna go into the details of it, but what's important is that for this problem that we're considering, this could be done analytically. We don't really have to solve uh, linear re regression decoding explicitly, but it is something that we could have done in principle if we wouldn't know the way to, 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 to get this covariance matrix analytically. So these were our selective decoding techniques. And now we can start uh, moving toward, towards the complete decoding techniques. And we start with the idea of explaining a way. And so as we already discussed complete decoding, we will, uh, the goal is to reconstruct the whole sequence. 
And the key idea behind this feedback-based decoding techniques is that since our vectors, they're not perfectly orthogonal, they, they're just uh, quasi-orthogonal. When we do their superposition, there is, there is still some crosstalk noise present once we superimpose these vectors. And so the idea that with, uh, with the explaining a way or with feedback in general is to cancel crosstalk noise. And by canceling crosstalk noise, we hope that, that we will be able to, you know, to, to, to make less errors when doing the decoding. And so this one, one particular technique that, that was uh, demonstrated in the hyperdimensional modulation paper by Hunsio team is, is a so-called uh, successive inference cancellation, or we, we use the term explaining away at, as it is also only present in uh, various domains. And so what, what is the essence of this idea is that we can use one of the selective decoding techniques to get our initial predictions. So we get our initial S hat using, using one of the selective decodings from the previous slide, but now we have additional steps. So now we have in this additional step, let's say we decode the symbol in position Y. So what we do, we take all the predictions in S hat that, that we already have, and we, we subtract, sort of, we, we sort of try to reconstruct the whole sequence except for the, for the current position of interest, except for the position of interest Y, with I, we, we reconstruct the whole distributed representation, everything but one symbol, and now we subtract it from Y. And assuming that most of the predictions were correct in, in our initial prediction decoding, then we can substantially reduce the cost of noise. And so we, we, would, uh, we would be able to correctly predict Y. And so now, and, and then uh, we can uh, do it as, as usually, we can now do the selective decoding, but now with the residual, now we, we call it Y hand. And so now, now we can repeat this procedure for several iterations. So now like we, we get as had predictions for, for, for the first iteration. So, so each, each and every position I between one and V. So we, we, we get uh, this new selective decoding. And then, so we use the updated predictions to go back to this part and, and we can loop through it several times. And for, we could easily stop when we reach uh, the predefined number of iterations, or we could stop if, if the, the solution after the next iteration is not different from uh, the current solution that we have, the, the current predictions. And so we, we, we can have a couple of flavors of this technique. So one would be code book explained in a way that the other would be linear regression explained in a way. And as a note, uh, I, I mentioned it here explicitly, but for the other decoding techniques that we're considering, they also can be subject to such kind of flavoring because now here we use some selective decoding techniques and since we have a couple of them, so automatically we get two decoding techniques out of single idea of explaining it. And so now, now we move on, and, and we are now talking about an, about an extra idea on top of the explaining way that, that we call much in pursuit. And the idea is that in when we do the explaining way here, right, we we create a rec reconstruction of B minus one uh, symbols in, in our sequence. And it's it works great to some extent, but here's the problem with that. If there are a lot of predictions that are incorrect, instead of removing the crosstalk noise, at some point we could start introducing an extra noise. Just because, because the prediction is wrong, now, the fact that we actually subtract the wrong prediction, we can think about, about it as, as if we would actually add an additional symbol into distributed representation of the sequence. And so in that sense, 
the crosstalk is not being reduced, but it's actually being increased. And so therefore, and we will actually see it on the experimental slides once, um, once, we, once we are into the experimental part, that uh, this might be challenging for this explaining away. And, and so how we can battle this problem while still using the idea of feedback, well, instead of subtracting all of them in, like all at once, we can actually subtract them one by one. So we, and, and like the question then, of course, there is a natural question, uh, which, uh, which position to subtract first. And here we can use the idea of uh, confidence. We can think of what are the ways to think, to measure the confidence of our predictions for a particular position. And we do it fairly simply. We just measure the, the, the difference between the cosine similarity to the to the largest to the to the to the to the position with the highest with the highest percent similarity and to the second one and of course I intuitively right that if the sec the, the largest one the largest percent similarity and the second largest percent similarity if they're very close to each other then we will get value that is very close to zero which means that yeah we don't we don't have that much confidence while if if the the largest similarity value is much higher than than all other ones we're going we're going to get like much larger much larger gap and so that would mean that yeah we have more confidence in in thinking that that this prediction is correct and so, so once uh, we have this idea of the confidence, so then at the current step, we can, uh, we can just take the position C that has the largest confidence value. And so now we remove the corresponding prediction for this position C uh, from, from our vector I. So now, like instead of removing the whole sum here, we just remove one particular one particular symbol. And then this symbol being removed, now we can repeat explaining away decoding with this residual. And then we then we again go back to step one, find the most confident prediction. But of course, we do not consider the predictions that have been chosen before. So that, that is technicality that, so we would have to do that bookkeeping. And so we continue explaining it now one by one. So we do it one symbol uh, after another. And now of course we have two flavors now, the, the much in pursuit with code book and much in pursuit with, with, linear, with, with linear regression. And why we call it much in pursuit, that, that's because there is actually such a technique uh, within, within um, sparse coding literature. And, and this idea is very similar, that we explain things in a greedy sense. So in some sense, it's a very greedy algorithm that we go one, one after another. And so we, we like rec recreate our signal one by one. So we, we, we do it one after the other. So that, that's why it's called much in pursuit. Uh, and now we have a slide about our uh, lasso based techniques. And so now we, we just need to recall that we, we, can we can reformulate our encoding as vector matrix multiplication. And so now we have our uh, optimization problem to be solved. And, and as already discussed, because V, v has only V non-zero components because V is a concatenation of one hot encodings. So even, even when D is not that large, it, it, X is still going to be sparse. And this reminds us of sort of, of yeah, blocks, it's, it's a block sparse vector essentially. And in this case, in this example, we, we have only three symbols in our, in our alphabet and then we represent a sequence of six such symbols. And so, yeah, because, because it is sparse, we can, we can add L1 norm regularization. And so we get the last problem. And 
two, as I already mentioned, two of the of the available inference method that we are going to use is uh, coordinate descent and coordinate this for coordinate descent we use just uh, secret learn optimization uh, uh, secret learn optim implementation of this optimization technique that is uh, that is available and for the FISTA algorithm we have our custom implementation and the final slide about the decoding techniques is is on the hybrid techniques and it's it's a big mess to describe this uh, hybrid te techniques it's it's not that easy to to kind of state them as, as a single equation. Uh, but here I have a, a pseudocode for an algorithm that is com that combines together coordinate descent and the matching pursuit with linear regression. And in that pseudocode, of course, we're not going to go into the details of the pseudocode, but we can think about three blocks that we do. So the first block is to do is to choose the initial predictions. And by by initial predictions, what we do, we just take our vector i and we eat when and we create predictions both with let's say coordinate descent. So we solve the last problem with coordinate descent. And alternatively, we solve this problem with uh, with linear regression matching pursuit. And then we we take we check which of these predictions overall seem to be better. And then we just we just use a cosine similarity between the reconstructed sequence using predictions from one technique and the reconstructed sequence using the other technique. And that's how we define which, which of the predictions is, seem to be more promising overall. And then we then we we have to we have to iterate. We do the loop starting from like we, we loop over B, B minus one symbols. And there we we use the idea of much in pursuit more or less. So we find this the position with, with that is most that seems to be the most confident. We fix it. We subtract it from the prediction, and then again we run in parallel either the coordinate descent in this case coordinate descent decoding or much in pursuit with linear regression. And then again we compare now now for the case of d minus one sequences which one seem to be better and we just loop in this manner like and we we kind of like fix one prediction after the other and the way we define which which position to fix is comes from this idea of the confidence that's how it all works so so it's a bit of a mess a lot of for loops and a lot of calling to the other existing functions the existing decoding methods that we predefined so now when we've covered all the decoding techniques, we can talk about uh, the evaluation. And, and this very first slide, the idea with the slide is just to, to present the backbone of the setup of the evaluation and just the kind of figures that we're gonna look. Cause, cause like, we, like at, the, at the next slide, we're gonna see all these pictures for several different code book signs. And so, uh, in the experimental setup, we follow that initial. We we follow the evaluation protocol from the brain informatics paper, and we we've averaged out to it. So it was, of course, all everything was pretty much empirical. So we've uh, we've done two hundred random sequences and average out the results across these two hundred random sequences. In total, we had. 10 decoding techniques, they, and here's the legend that defines them. And so the color, color is used here to define a particular type of decoding technique, like we have blue color for the code book decoding, then we have a red color for linear regression-like selective decoding. Uh, and then we have also uh, two colors for, for lasso-like decoding techniques. So one black one is FISTA and green one is coordinate descent. And otherwise then dashes are used in order to refer to kind of techniques that are building on top of the other technique. Like in this case, we have explaining a way for the case of uh, with code book decoding. And so this is blue dashed line. Similarly, we have the same thing for the linear regression and then dotted lines are used now for much in pursuit. 
uh, and correspondingly, like we have like dotted black and dotted print lines for match and pursuit, that 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 combines also now piece that or coordinate descent. So these are this um, these dotted lines are our hybrid techniques. And we in the first three experiments, we fix the dimensionality of hypervectors to 500, but consider it three different code book sizes, 5, 15, and, and 100, respectively. And the three types of plots that we have is uh, one for accuracy. And so now we have accuracy on the y-axis, and it is against the number of the stored symbols in our sequence. Then we... The, the other type of, of panel is now using this value, this accuracy values to compute information rate in bits per dimension. So that, that is exact, exactly the metric we discussed at the beginning as a part of background. And finally, uh, it's also interesting because because we saw already in the case of hybrid technique, right, that, that it, the hybrid technique can, for example, call a lot of other techniques as a part of this process. So it might, it might call other decoding techniques multiple times while, while doing the decoding. And so therefore, it is worth thinking about the idea of the complexity, like how, how complex is this particular decoding, right? Because one thing is, is, let's say, the information rate that you get from the uh, decoding technique. But the other thing is how much is, 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 going, is it going to cost you to do it decoding? And to do so, we, we just use the idea, the idea of again empirical idea of complexity using floating point operations. And in order to measure the floating point operations, we use the so-called uh, performance application programming inter interface library that allows you to, to like compute the number of flows for a particular piece of code. So that 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 is how we measure it, uh, these flows. And this is the third type of panel. And so given, given this type of panels, so now we can get to the very first experiment that is noiseless decoding. And it's noiseless in the sense that there is no external noise, but of course there is crosstalk noise that, that, that we already were talking about. And so now we have uh, here on, on this figure, we have nine panels. And so the first row are, uh, are accuracy panels. And so it's, Left column is code book size, that is of size five. Center column is uh, code book size fifteen, and top right column is a code book of size one hundred. And so middle row is our information rate per bit, and uh, the complexity in flops is in the low in, is in the lower lowest row. And so even so, there are a lot of curves. First, we can start talking about them one by one, and we can start looking at the, uh, at the accuracy first. And our most basic curve is the code book decoding. And so this is our blue line. And there is also like dashed gray line, gray line. it might be hard to see it, but that, that shows the analytical, the analytical treatment because the code book decoding could be predicted analytically. And that comes from this uh, 2018 neural computation paper that, that I was mentioning as a, as a par part of the background for the story. And that's, we can see it here that it's actually available on, uh, on each and every panel and, and the analytical prediction follows pretty close to the empirical result. And, uh, but then uh, what we can see here is that so when we look at the other decoding technique, uh, let's say linear regression, it can improve the high fidelity mode. So right where, where we have like accuracy, decoding accuracy that is close to one, it can improve it substantially when the, uh, when the size of the code book is small, but as we increase the size of the code book, we can see that solid red line is getting closer and closer to the uh, to, to the code book based decoding, and and this this is uh, this this is pretty well aligned with all the previous results. So as far as we continue increasing the size of the code book, we cannot leverage much by just considering the covariance information. Then what's what's next interesting is uh, is how 
uh, let's say the idea of explaining away here, right, the dashed line, the dashed blue line, and so we have to compare it to the solid blue line, it improves the high fidelity mode quite a bit compared to this to, to this initial code book decoding. But at some point we can see that it it you know it goes down very abruptly. And that happens exactly because of, of what we discussed, the shortcoming of um, of this explaining away idea that at some point here, at some point, and of course our baseline here is the code book decoding, right? Because it gives our us the initial prediction. And so here we had enough errors in the sense that they, instead of subtracting the crosstalk noise, they started adding additional crosstalk noise. And from that point, the decoding just, just you know, behaves, ill behaves, it, it goes, very close to the, to it goes down like to the to the, very close to the random guess that is denoted here by the dashed line. And of course, for every different value of d, we have different baselines for the random guess because random guess is one over d. Uh, that's interesting. And of course, then we see that the matching pursuit idea that is dotted line. So let's say blue dotted line here, right? The 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 matching pursuit boss it it continued expanding the high fidelity mode compared to the explaining away. And, but then it also reduced this issue of like falling down very abruptly once the errors start to appear. So it eventually converges to the code book based decoding, which makes sense that eventually it must behave you know, exactly the same way as the code book based decoding. Uh, then we also could see when talking about the lasso based optimization techniques, we could also see that alone, they like alone they perform fairly well. So here we can see the solid black line and the solid green line. And so for each figure, well, I mean, while like in this case, for example, like for larger value of D, like the coordinate descent seemed to be better than, than FISTA. Um, and it's, it's actually, the case for all three code book sizes, but it's just the most pronounced, we still could see that, for example, FISTA alone performs better than this uh, code book or selective based techniques. And final, the final observation is that it's, it becomes very powerful if we combine the lasso based uh, technique is the FISTA or coordinate descent with with the much in pursuit ideas and this this is this are our dashed black and green lines right they 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 you know the ones that go most to the right the ones that extend extend the high fidelity mode high fidelity mode the most and of course as a consequence because we have long high fidelity mode it also transforms into the high amount of information bits that we can decode from the decoding. And so therefore, we can see here that for all three sizes of code books, the peak values, the absurd peak values, they, they, they are obtained using the hybrid techniques. And also notably, the purple dashed lines, uh, this, uh, this is a, this is a baseline. So this is the best results that were reported in the uh, brain informatics paper. And so, so here we can see that uh, hybrid uh, decoding techniques, they allow us improving, like in, improving the information rate, in, like, like kind of the, the, the amount of, the largest amount of information that could be extracted from distributed representation for each uh, size of the code book. And this is especially most pronounced for the case when the code book size is large. Uh, and probably, yeah, we're kind of getting out of time, but probably the final thing to say here is that when it comes to complexity, uh, it's, it's like very natural in the sense that like the, the selective decoding techniques, they are very cheap to compute because it's just single vector matrix multiplication. We, we don't have to do like any extra bookkeeping. We don't have to repeat the decoding for several times. And so therefore they, they really like lie, they lie next to zero here. And of course know that, that this axis is logarithmic. And for, for other techniques, like effectively, like, a, you know, it's, it's fair to say that 
the more complex, the, the more capable technique is of extracting information, the more computations it would require. Like, like here, the, the, the most complex techniques are the hybrid ones in all three figures. And so that suggests as the idea of the trade-off. So in that in a way, the trade-off in the sense that if we want to extract more information from the distributed representation, I mean, given that it's available, that we haven't really extracted all the available information, we can do so by, by using more complex techniques, but we should be able and we should be ready to pay for that in terms of computations. So it's almost like information computation trade-off here. Uh, and then there are a few more slides with the evaluation, and I won't spend too much time on them, but uh, the, the natural idea of encoding this noiseless situation was to add external noise. And so, and this is done by just including so the, the sigma here. So we just include additional white noise, uh, and then we just float the, the decoding accuracy for a particular combination of code book size, uh, and the number of symbols stored um, it, within the representation, and we just vary the amount of noise. And so what we see there, is, and, and that's that will be important for our conclusion, is that uh, when the, the amount of noise is very low, the code book technique is actually great. So because it starts like demonstrating some results, some solid results, even for, for low amount of noise, but of course, eventually, what we see that eventually once the signal to noise ratio is high, so we don't have too much external noise, uh, then other techniques, other decoding techniques, they kick in and, and they start to perform better than the decoding technique. But in terms of the low noise mode, the, the code book decoding is a solid option to use. And then the third, uh, the, the third experiment was about limited precision. So it's also in some sense uh, adding external noise, external disturbances, but now uh, more for the sake of using the representations of limited precisions, right? Because in the previous results, our superposition vector was linear and it might not be great, right? We might, we might want to store this uh, superposition vector using some limited number of storage bits per dimension, per component of this vector. And then the simplest case to do so in this case is just to use the idea of the clipping function. And so now the value, the value of the clipping parameter kappa allows us controlling how many bits we're gonna store, we're gonna use uh, you know, to store per dimension. And this is our X axis in these figures. So it's like how much memory we we dedicated per component of hypervector, but otherwise we do the same thing. So we, we measure the accuracy, then we measure the information bit per dimension, and now the lower panel is information bit bit per bit in a sense, right? Because now we can use this idea because we it's very easy now to 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 compute the total amount of bits we need to store was a whole hypervector. And so now it's like information bits per storage bits. And so here, what, what's interesting here is that uh, when you actually plot the results using this idea of bit per bit, then you actually, like on the previous figures, we saw on the, on the one peak, but here there is, there is kind of two peaks in a way, that there is the peak that is, that is coming, um, sort of from the previous, that is coming from the noiseless case essentially. Uh, and, and this peak is achieved uh, it here, right? So, so this peak is achieved once you get to such, um, to such number of storage bits so that, that your vector is almost undisturbed because once your vector is, is undisturbed or almost undisturbed, all kind of complex techniques that are based on the idea of the feedback, they start working. They're working well. Because what we see here uh, on the accuracy curves is that when, when, like, when the amount of storage bit, bits is low, which means that, that we kind of very heavily, you know, when we heavily applied clipping, let's say at the value of one, so we, we pretty much, we almost apply the sign function, 
then the idea of feedback is meaningful. Then again, uh, the code book based decoding performs just as well as anything else. Uh, and, uh, and therefore, uh, therefore, we can see this, this, this other peak at the very beginning when we, when we use very, very few bits in order to store our hypervector. And we, we are not able to, to extract that much of the information when, when it comes to decoding. Uh, but anything that we are capable of ex extracting can be pretty much uh, obtained just using the simplest case of the code book decoding technique. But that is, of course, not the case later on. Like as, as we as we dedicate more and more storage bits per dimension, then we start to see that uh, that the more complex techniques they're kicking in because they allow us extracting more information because because we we get uh, we get, we get into the high fidelity mode, and then that turns that kind of inversely con conver converges to larger total amount of information that we extract from the hypervector. And then when we divide by the number of storage bits, uh, that, that, that results in, in the best peak. And of course, as we would continue increasing the number of uh, bits per dimension, as far as we're in the high fidelity mode, that is not going to help us with anything. So therefore, the bit per bit information rate will just continue declining. Uh, so I, th I think uh, that that is the final slide when it comes to evaluation. There is nothing special there. It's, it just shows that indeed, as we can continue increasing the dimensionality, we can get to perfect accuracy with any decoding technique, even with code book decoding technique. And the final takeaway is that so so that in that project, our goal was to survey, categorize, categorize, and compare available decoding techniques. All, we've, we've also noticed that decoding techniques from air, various research areas can be utilized. And well, one idea was reservoir computing, and this is how we got the, the, the concept of readout matrix, the successive interference cancellation slash explaining the way it came from communications, much in pursuit and la last, so it, come, it comes from signal sparse representation. Also, we've, we saw that uh, hybrid decoding techniques allows us getting new information read bounds. Also, lasso techniques alone, they perform exceptionally well. We saw the trade-off between computation complexity and information read. And finally, we actually saw that uh, overall, the code book, the code book decoded when considered overall scenarios when there could be presence of noise, there is, could be presence of uh, non-idealities that, that comes from the fact that we are using limited storage. Uh, that, that, that allows us actually saying that uh, in, in like when considering like the, the sort of the overall performance code book decoding might still be a decent choice despite all these more complex uh, opportunity or, or com more complex alternatives. Yeah, and yeah, that was that is final as a final slide. All right, Dennis, thank you very much for this uh, presentation of your very systematic and methodological work. Thank you very much indeed. Um, well, uh, I see uh, a question in the chat. I think, uh, in my opinion, you have answered uh, in one of, uh, I mean, on the corresponding slide. But Paul, if you are not satisfied, say. Uh, and then it will comment about the uh, uh, complexity graphs and the solid lines that decrease in the flocks. Yes, okay. So yeah, I, th I thought so too. And you also addressed my question uh, about the clipping, <laughs> so which I had somehow. But uh, so probably I can ask the audience. Uh, so any other questions, please? see uh, maybe i can uh, while uh, people are uh, collecting their thoughts um one, one question about the co complexity and the 
um, real computational optimizations. I mean, this uh, algorithms, um, can they be run on some dedicated hardware for uh, kind of still fast performance? So in a kind of parallel way? So I, I guess this uh, flops, uh, so this is, uh, I, I mean. Yeah, by no means flops is like, is, is an optimal way to demonstrate. Exactly. Like it's it's like good enough to demonstrate this idea of trade off. That, yeah, that, sorry, that I mean, thing. obviously it's kind of order of magnitude uh, more complex, uh, obviously. Right, right, yes. But, but of course, I mean, well, first of all, right, like, even so, like we're using flops, but for the code book decoding, you don't really need flops because it's bipolar matrix, right? It's, there is there is no need to do floating point operations. We just do them for the sake of convenience because it's just convenient to represent it as as a matrix. And yeah, and it's it would probably use the least available precision, but it still would be like a floating point precision because otherwise it's very common. That uh, you know the that that the packages would start complaining that there, that for this data type the vector matrix multiplication is not available something like that. But of course, uh, in principle, it's it's in practice could be like the code book decoding could be even cheaper to compute because it's plus minus ones. So it doesn't you don't even need to do the floating point no. you just you just do the the summation and, yes. and you just take care of the sign dependent whether it's plus or minus in a particular position mm -hmm. uh, i'm not sure about uh, i'm not sure about let's say this last so last of these optimizers i i probably because you would have to compute the gradients and things like that so i'm not sure if well, but, but then of course there are algorithms such as LC, and this LC, this is a competitive algorithm for sparse coding. And for LC, the, there is a fast implementation in neuromorphic hardware. So that's another example where, where one can actually get fairly, fairly complex uh, algorithm that is solved in optimization procedure that could be implemented fairly efficiently in non-conventional hardware. Yeah, mm -hmm. so there is a lot of room for like doing this complexity yeah. and probably arguing about it. But I think it's important to have this idea of, okay, that you have a whole spectrum, you follow, you have a whole continuum of like, is it doing the simplest possible thing, but getting, spending the least amount of resources, but getting the least performance out of it. Or yeah. you can have way more complex method, squeeze more ju juice out of your distributed representation, sort of to say, but you have to be ready to spend more resources while doing so. I mm -hmm. think that's that's idea. At least I haven't seen it before. I think that that idea wasn't 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 on the map. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. I I agree. Um, all right. Did you uh, did the audience ma uh, make their mind about possible questions? Dennis, can I just ask? <clears> have <throat> I understood this correctly? If if you increase the dimensionality of the vector, are you saying that the core variance be becomes uh, it it doesn't matter anymore? It's all, this only Really matters for, for for smaller vectors for vectors of lower dimensionality. Uh, oh, that, that, that's right, Graham. Yes, exactly. This is what okay. I'm saying. Uh -huh. Yeah. Okay. And that that basically comes from the fact that there are so many vectors. Like like when the code book size is so large that it's uh, you you cannot basically. Um, find enough structure like they basically become in like random random enough in a sense that, that it's, it's hard to optimize like their crosstalk noise you, you cannot really like get get uh, improvement in terms of crosstalk noise yeah is they're not that predictable anymore yeah got it okay thanks
Um, from my side, maybe I have uh, another question just to increase my understanding. Um, the um, information rate above one, so that, that to me, that, that's a kind of good thing, right? So, I mean, this is something that, that we are, uh, we want to end up. So basically, I mean, uh, so that our recording is not uh, redundant. Is my interpretation correct? Yes, yes and no, in the sense that it's above one bit, but it's not per like storage bit, but it's per dimension. Yeah, yeah, per dimension. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Per per, dimension, I, but, I mean per dimension. Yeah. Ah, yes, okay. I, I but it. of course here, here yes, it's- Yes, of course, yeah. I, I get it, yes. So, mm -hmm. so in a way, like a more fair way to look at it, right, would be this figure where it's bit per bit, because now we have information bit per storage bit, and, and here it's like not that pretty. It's like 0.25. Anyways, it brings me back to, I mean, we, we need uh, NRE processors. So, yeah. Ternary computers is yes. an old, old thing yes. that has been forgotten. Exactly. So I, mean, it, so, yeah. I mean, all this binary stuff is all, uh, is all old, you know. Yeah, yeah, but essentially it's good. I mean, in the sense that I mean, when we were doing the neural computation paper, which was five years ago, uh, that that is, I think our best estimate was something like 0 0.5, if I'm or 0 0.6 bit per dimension. Yeah, but that doesn't and because, so that, yeah. that's because you did linear regression there. Yeah, that, that was a, like kind of, we haven't thought about like uh, connections to this, uh, techniques from the sparse coding literature and, and this kind of extra ideas about explaining away things and, and doing this gradual explaining away like in the case of much in pursuit idea. Yeah, yeah. So but but all all this effectively you know you know all this advancement kind of they come just from the fact that once you realize ah there is a, a lot of algorithms yeah. that that that, that exist and within sparse coding and compressed sense in literature and you can formulate your problem in the same terms and you just you know the, it opens the whole the whole door just yeah, yeah. come up with your algorithm because people were thinking about these things for like decades in, in this yeah. in these areas yeah. I, I I agree. All right um okay so last chance for asking questions I think we are running uh, already towards midnight in yeah, Sweden anyways. No more questions? All right, Dennis, uh, thank you once again uh, for this talk and thank you all for attending uh, today's webinar. So I'll see you in two weeks from now uh, on the last uh, open floor session. So about discussing the challenges of VSA. So in two weeks on Thursday, the 15th of June, 15th of June, 8 p.m. I will send a separate email about this. Thank you all for attending. Have a good week. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Thanks. Bye.